28, verse 17. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. Just hold your hand up. <clears throat> Someone will come, give you a Bible, and that's going to be yours. Um, we just ask you to read it and believe it and follow it and preach it. Um, Acts 28, verse 17. <clears throat> It'll be up on the screen as well. And the word of the Lord says as follows. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will believe. They will listen. Excuse me. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. In our final installment in the book of Acts, I want to talk to you about the still unchained gospel. Pray with me. Father, we are before you this morning in humility and in expectation and anticipation that you would speak to us. We thank you for the last 15 months of only scratching the surface, of only beginning to see the immense value and power of the gospel. We pray that as we close this message today, that we not close this book forever, nor close our hearts to the truths that you have been putting before us week after week, the realities and principles, those unchanging truths, those revelations of who you are and how you love, of your power and your might of what Christian service is to look like, of how intimately you walk with those who serve you. Father, we love you for your word is life and light and bread. Your spirit is to us water that springs up unto salvation. And I pray today that exactly that would happen. It's someone who has been tasting, coming close, but not in. 
standing on the outside, peering into the joys and the beauties of you. But today, forsake all else, for all is less. And that they would bow down to the gospel that we have seen preached so faithfully in the book of Acts. Help us to preach it faithfully today from this pulpit. Open every heart. And as we do, Lord, I pray for our children's ministry as well. As they break the bread of your word, let the gospel fill this house from one end to the other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can take your seats. <clears throat> And we're right back at it and right back in it. And it's been kind of tough at certain stretches of the book of Acts because you feel like you just can't get your breath. It just keeps coming at you. It's kind of like drinking out of a fire hydrant. Um, it, and, and that was Paul's life. And that's the life still of anyone who's so given to the will and the work of the Lord. Um, just in the last couple of chapters, we've seen uh, a two-year stint in prison. We've seen a horrible storm, a shipwreck. We've seen a small island evangelized. We've seen snake bite. We've seen changed plans. And we've seen God prove himself over and over again, both faithful and gracious. Faithful in that he's fulfilled his promise. As we get to, to verse 17 today, he's fulfilled his promise, a promise that he made to Paul and, and, and reaffirmed it, confirmed it to him on a couple of occasions saying, you're going to Rome. I know it doesn't look like it. I know it looks like you're going to the bottom of the ocean. I know it looks like you're going to a grave from a snake bite, but the, the fact of the matter is you're going to Rome. And you will bear witness of the gospel, not just in the palace, but he specifically says before Caesar, you, you will, and it's going to happen. And we see God's faithfulness in that through all of those things that apparently would have precluded him from seeing Rome and seeing Caesar. By the time we get to verse 17, Paul is in Rome. Blessed be the Lord. And, and, and we, we could stop at verse 17 and go home encouraged because if God is true to this promise, he is true to every other promise. And think of all of the other promises that are ours, the least of which is not his soon, imminent, glorious return to where there will be no headaches or heartaches or sleepiness or backaches or Mondays. And he's promised that we will forever be with him. Not just with him, but it says we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. And he's faithful as he is gracious. Because in the midst of all of that seeming chaos in Paul's life, just things coming at him, apparently randomly just just befalling him, just things that he hadn't planned for, most of them apparently unpleasant with no redeeming qualities in them at all. But at the end of it all, we see that through it all, through all of the ups and downs and storms and shipwrecks, at the end of it all, prisoners and sailors and soldiers and natives on a small island have all heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is gracious, and by the end, we see him in Rome. And what a picture of God's grace, because there was not a great, greater cesspool of sin in the world at that time than Rome. Every ill, every evil that could be practiced was practiced in spades in Rome. And this is where God chooses to send the gospel. And we see his grace and that God would send his holy apostle carrying this holy message into this city. He had established a church in this city. What grace of God and what grace that goes even beyond Rome because Rome was such a metropolis that God knew that the gospel would not just go to but through Rome to the rest of the world. What a gracious God we serve. And his grace just keeps being unpacked and unfolded as we go through this book of Acts and it brings us to today in verse 17, and Paul has arrived in Rome, and it says very clearly there that after three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and he began to share with them some things, and <clears throat> after 
such a harrowing journey. After, been, being, after having gone through what he'd gone through, after having suffered what he had suffered, he gets to Rome and as soon as humanly possible, three days later, mind you, he didn't, he didn't send a group text, he didn't post something that everybody read. To get people together in a big city like Rome and call a meeting, that was not easy. But he didn't waste any time. As soon as he got there, three days later, he's making things move already. There wasn't time for a break. There wasn't time for a rest. There wasn't time for just relaxing a little bit. He, he had an urgency about him. And you remember that Paul, every time he'd go into a new city, he'd never been to Rome before. And every time he'd go to a city he'd never been to before, he always had a, a method to his, to his message. He always had a way that he would go about this. And it followed what the scriptures said, that the gospel was for the Jew first and also for the Gentiles. And so he would always go and find the synagogue if there was one there and begin to share with the Jews. Some would believe, most would reject, and then he'd go on to the Gentiles. But when he gets to Rome, he doesn't have that luxury. There was a synagogue. There were Jews. The problem was that Paul was under house arrest. And Paul is locked up in a house, not just locked up in a house, but he's chained to a Roman soldier. And he can't go to the synagogue. And what does one do when there are obstacles in, in the way of gospel work? One could fold one's hands and say, Lord, you know I tried. Lord, you know I would if I could. You ever pray that one? But there's no such surrender in Paul's heart. Holy Spirit doesn't fold his hands. And since Paul couldn't go to the synagogue, he invited the synagogue to him. Now, you've got to see the, you've got to see the, the, the strangeness of this. You've got to see the extremity of what Paul is doing. By the time Paul leaves to come to Rome, the Jews have already made their case. Remember, it was the Jews that were prosecuting the case against him. They wanted him dead. They wanted him dead. They wanted him dead at all costs. They wanted him dead. And so they put him in front of the Romans. They put him in front of Felix and Festus and Agrippa. Somebody kill him. By the time he gets shipped off to Rome, the Jews were done. They said, well, at least he's out of our hair. There was no other hearing date set. There were no Jewish attorneys on their way following Paul to meet him and further prosecute the case against him. As far as the Jews were done, as far as the Jews were concerned, they were done. And as far as, as far as Paul was concerned, he was done with the Jews. Those folks who hated him more than anyone else, Paul could have said, I'm done with them. I don't have to stand before them anymore, but when he gets to Rome, who are the first people he looks up? The Jews. I think so many of us would have said, if I don't see another Jew in my life, except in the mirror, says Paul, I'll be happy. It's been nothing but pain from these Jews. But the first thing he does when he gets to that city is, let's find the Jews. you got to note the lack of bitterness in his heart. How many of you would be mistreated that way and still have a gospel passion for someone? To be, to be able to overlook the venom that they had towards you to try and give them the message that brings salvation. I was reading something the other day, if I'm not mistaken, it was by William Still. And he was a pastor who had pastored over 50 years at one church. And a young pastor came to him and he asked him, what is, what is the one piece of advice you would give me after so many years of working so hard and preaching the gospel to so many people? He says, I'm just starting my ministry. What is the one piece of advice that you would give me that will help me the most? And the old man looked him straight in the face and he just says, don't take it personally. Don't, it's not about you. It's about the gospel. They may hate you, they may stone you, they may mock you, they may, they may talk behind your back, but it's not about you. It never was about you. So when they love you, keep preaching. When they hate you, keep preaching. It's all about Jesus. And Paul gets to Rome and he looks up those who hated him the most. Why? It wasn't about Paul. 
And we could stand to learn a lot from that. You see, you see that there's no bitterness there. Even in his words, it says, when he had called them together, he said, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, Yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty. They wished to set me at liberty, but because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. Roman law said that the Jews couldn't carry out their own executions. It had to be turned over to the Romans. And it frustrated the Jews because Paul would have been dead a long, long time ago. And the Roman judicial system was moving way too slow and Little did they know and little did they bargain for that Paul was not just someone who needed a fair trial. He was a Roman citizen and so he was getting all the full rights. And they were frustrated by it. Paul says there was no reason for a death penalty. That's, that's not what the Romans are willing to do. What I've done is not deserving of such a thing. In verse 19, he says, but because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. And then he tries to let them know, but, but, but there's no hard feelings when he says, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. He says, know this, I'm going to have a hearing before Caesar, but I'm not standing before Caesar to tell him how badly I've been treated by the Jews. I'm standing before Caesar to tell him there is a king greater than you, Nero. His name is Jesus. That's what my mission is. Don't think that I've come to try and tear down the nation of the Jews. No, that wasn't, that wasn't Paul's heart at all. After suffering so much at the hands of the Jews, there was no bitterness left. His focus was only the gospel of grace. And if there's someone in your life that you know needs Jesus, and the only thing that precludes them from hearing the gospel is that they've hurt you in some time past, Learn from Paul today. Learn from Jesus today. Father, forgive them. And if that's the only thing keeping you from sharing Jesus with somebody, is that you're estranged because of some argument at some Thanksgiving or some thank you card you didn't get, it's not about you. This thing is so much bigger and Paul got it. And he said in Romans 9, just a couple of years earlier, when he'd written to the Romans that were already believers, he said that he had great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart. He doesn't talk about the pain on his back from the beatings. He doesn't talk about the suffering from the stones that the Jews threw at him. He says, no, the pain that I feel when I think of the Jews is in my heart because they're so close Having Moses and the law and the prophets, they're so close to knowing who Jesus is. He says, and it kills me, it hurts me that they don't know. You know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for nationalism. I'm, I'm actually, frankly, a little bothered by the extremities of patriotism that you see in some people. Just for no reason at all, loyal to some piece of dirt. More so than to God. Grateful to God for the good things he gives us and the lands that he lets us live in, but, but bizarre degrees of patriotism. That being said, God in his providence allows us to be born in certain places, to certain races, and to certain cultures. And we ought to feel as we do for the rest of the world, but we ought to feel some kind of a burden for our people. I mean, nobody espouses multiculturalism as it, as it pertains to the gospel more than we do, but, but still, to say, I, I don't care about this country, the nation of my origin, the, the place of, of, of my forefathers, that, that, that would be small. understanding that he could say like Joseph said after his brothers had treated him so poorly he says I get it I'm not denying that you had evil intention for me but what you intended for evil God meant for good and I'm so glad that despite the pain and the scars that will never go away and the bones that never set quite right and all that I've been through I'm so glad that things worked out the way they did because I get to share the gospel with you here in Rome today, he says. 
A deep understanding of God's sovereignty and God's providence over our lives will help us to avoid the bitterness that comes with being hurt in life. We'll come to see that God, through miraculous and mysterious ways, ways that he does not offer us some little prima donna explanation for, he says, this is your lot. In it, I have found you with the gospel. Glorify me in it. And it is incumbent upon us to say, for the things I understand and the things that I do not, Thank you. Thank you. Like the song that we just sang, will I receive good and not evil as well? But to say all of it has God's fingerprints on it. How? I don't know. Why? I don't get it. I'll, maybe I'll ask him when I get there, but I have a sneaking suspicion that when I get there and I see his glorious face, the last thing on my mind is going to be, why did you do it like that? I'm just going to dance because he did it. So really, there's no space anymore in that heart that wants to serve God for bitterness because of cruel or negligent parents, because of being born on the wrong side of the tracks, because of favoritism in the family or the classic bad church experience. No. I don't have time I am not commissioned to bitterness. I am not called to look back. I set those things behind. I press forward towards the mark of the prize of the upward call of God. And he moves. And while he can't move physically, he moves to bring people to him so that the gospel can keep going. Because this is Paul, man. This is Paul, the world traveler. This is Paul who, 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 who lived out of a knapsack, if he had a knapsack. This is Paul who we always saw on the move. Who, who In those days, that, that kind of traveling was odd and rare. People didn't travel like that, didn't make a life out of it. But that was Paul's life, was to take the gospel where it had not been preached. And all of a sudden, Paul can no longer go. But neither could he stop. And sometimes we don't deal with those stations of our life where things get really stationary. And we lose all creativity. And we pray those prayers that say, oh, if I could have, I would have. But the circumstances didn't lend themselves to glorious gospel work. And I have no sense of gospel creativity or resourcefulness in this. So I'll do nothing till the circumstances become ideal. So the writer of Ecclesiastes warns us that he who regards the wind and the clouds will never sow the seed. Because the perfect day doesn't come. Yet the scripture says today is the day of salvation. So our longing for perfection and primrose paths, I mean, should have been done away with about 13 weeks ago. Maybe 13 months ago in the book of Acts. And Paul's moving on, but he says, I understand. I'm not bitter. I know why this is all happening. It's because of the gospel. It's not because of your hatred. It's not because of the, the despot Romans. No, it, it's, it's because I signed up for this. And when I weigh it against what I receive in Christ, that's why he writes in Romans 8.18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I put it on the scales. He probably did this every day, multiple times. I'm suffering so much. Wait, wait, wait. Before you go down that dark road, Paul, put it in the scales. The glory that awaits, the pain that is present. Oh my God, let's keep going. And he says, I, my only fault is that I have believed what the Jews have only claimed to believe. I have held to what they have sung about. I have lived for what they have pontificated over. He says, no, I believe it. And, 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 and ladies and gentlemen, learn from this as well. Let us not expect anything else. Even in the ranks of Christendom, when you begin to live for what other people sing about, 
When you, when you begin to, to completely sell out to the things that they pay lip service to, when you begin to walk out the things they stick on their bumpers, you raise the bar without wanting to. You're doing it unto the Lord, but it creates a different atmosphere when someone begins to live for Jesus and not just for the minimums. And it causes some people to lash out. It causes some people to, to gossip. It causes some people to get angry. It causes some people to be bothered by the fact that it's so much easier if everybody would keep it down low, just be nominal Christians, just, just do it on Sundays. I mean, keep work at work and church at church. Here you are living it. And sometimes you'll find yourself treated poorly for truly believing what others claim to believe. And that's still the case today. Verse 21 says, And they said to him, Hey, we've received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming has reported, spoken evil about you. Now, it's, that's debated amongst a lot of scholars whether these guys were lying or not. I mean, there was such a network amongst the Jews to say that they had heard nothing. I mean, this was Paul who was accused of turning the world upside down. They were waiting for him in just about every city he got to. And that Rome would not know, it's kind of dubious, but nonetheless, they do show that, well, maybe we haven't received official papers regarding you. We were not told to wait and attack you when we saw you, but we have heard of Jesus. Say in verse 22, but we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Well, that's a pretty unbiased statement, huh? Everywhere it is spoken against? No, I don't think so, man. Maybe you haven't been to Malta lately. Where everybody who was sick is healed. Go ask Publius' dad if he's speaking against Christianity. But he reveals his heart, this leader of the Jews, or this, these spokespeople of the Jews, when they call the church a sect. And they, review, and they refer to, to Paul's gospel as his views. Isn't that the easy way of getting around it? Well, let me, let me see. I know how I like to serve Jesus. You tell me how you serve Jesus. Oh, those are your views? These are my views. You got your Jesus, I've got my Jesus. And everybody thinks they're right. You, see, you serve Jesus your way and I'll serve him his way. Because I'm right. But it's all a matter of views and nobody's quite wrong and nobody's quite right and it doesn't matter. And there is no absolute truth and hence we have what we have today. And this Jew says, well, you view things a different way, but he couldn't help but inject a little bit of hatred in there when he says, this sect is spoken against everywhere. And when he calls it a sect, he uses a Greek word that, where we get the word heresy from. He's calling them false teachers. He's calling it a false religion. He's saying there's some wayward fringe group. A wayward fringe group that in about 35 years has covered the known world with a message of grace, peace, and redemption. Demons are cast out. Sick are healed. But the Jews opt for dead, dry religion. And while Paul says, I'm being put on trial for believing what you have claimed to believe, I had hope that you had, but my hope was fulfilled and satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ. But because you've denied him, you've been left with nothing but the shell, the remnant. You've been, been left with a, a bygone covenant. But they said, we don't want to be bothered with the reality. Speaking of a, of a singing, of a writing poems of a Messiah that was to come is nice. It makes for nice holidays and feast days and all these new moons and all these things. They're just wonderful with that little dangling hope, that carrot that we put out in front of the nation that says, one day, someday, 
a Messiah will come. And you come saying that he has come and that he came and he lived and he died and he rose and he ascended and he sent his spirit and he started a church that he's soon to come back for. That just rocks the boat too much. That would completely undo our whole gig here, man. Don't bother us with those kind of realities. In verse 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. And from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. We see Paul, because he couldn't go to where they were, inviting them to where he was. And it says that he worked. It says from morning until evening. It was, it was his life. It wasn't, I'm on some ministry calendar where I show up every eighth week or something. No. This is it's what I do. Matter of fact, it's in my home. You know, after all of his hard work and all of his suffering, he's still working. And, and, and it shows up in his home. You've heard that expression, hey, work smart, not hard. In the gospel, you do both. And Paul, from morning till evening, reminding you of his advanced years, his hard journeys, all that he's been through, and he invites these people into his home. And, 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 and near Eastern culture, when people come into your home, that creates its own work. Because it's not like us. Or we don't even put down the remote when people walk in. Hey, come in, sit down. No, you got up. You washed their feet. You anoint them with oil. You put bread before them. You give, uh, you give food and water to their animal. You take, you take care of them. And when they leave, you leave them with something in their hands. And he had this parade of people coming through his house. It's hard work. Hard work. And he did it from morning until evening. He didn't have that strange compartmentalized life. You know how we do that? Church is for over there. I remember I went to visit a, a family one time. Other state. Exhale. Exhale, everybody. And I remember I, 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 this was a long, long time family in our church, and I, and, and I went to go visit them. Um, they had some things going on and almost had to force my way into their home. They didn't need, they didn't want help, wouldn't come for help, and I could see they were about ready to just implode. I said, I'm, I'm, I, want, I want to go over to your house tomorrow. I want to sit with you. I want to talk with you. And when we got there, their children looked at me like, Two very separate worlds had collided. Looking at mom and dad, you just brought the church guy into the house. And and little eight-year-old kid walks up and says, What are you doing here? You're from the church. Which led in the conversation to how often do you show hospitality to people? Come to find out I knew exactly why they wouldn't. They had a whole different set of norms. They had a whole different set of words that they used. They had a whole different set of behaviors. At church they were, hi brother, how are you? At home they were dropping F-bombs and slamming doors. For Paul, those lines all got blurred as they should for us. I'm not saying there's not a time for privacy. I'm not saying there's not a time for family. But by God, the gospel's too big to cram it into this building for two hours on Sunday. And Paul has them in his home. And it says he went to work from morning till evening, it says. And it's interesting, Paul, Paul threw the kitchen sink at these guys. I mean, when, when, when you've got a chance to share the gospel with somebody and you don't know that you're, you're ever going to get a second chance, you go for broke, man. 
That's for some of us that have been pussyfooting around for the last nine years, hoping that, that your family will notice the way you say grace at Thanksgiving and fall out in repentance. No, the gospel is to be preached. Paul says, I'm going for it. And he uses three different verbs. Luke says that he used three different ways that he did this. It says that from morning till evening, he expounded, he testified, and he tried to convince. He used every weapon in his arsenal. He expounded. That means he laid out, explained the scriptures, presented the evidence. He says, listen, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not pulling this out of the clear blue sky. I have scripture for this. And he lays out the evidence before them, but that's not enough. It wasn't just some apologetics. It wasn't just a debate. He says, we're not here on, e we're not here on even ground comparing views of things. I am preaching truth to someone who is in error. So it's not enough for me to just lay out a few pieces of evidence. It says that he didn't just expound. He testified. That is to insistently bear witness or to, in the Greek, warn. Here is the evidence, and he makes the application of the evidence. The evidence is that the scriptures promised that a Messiah would come to take away the sins of the world. He has come, and all that believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And if you don't believe in him, there is a warning. You will go to hell. And, and I hope that warning's not lost on somebody in this place today who's playing with God. The evidence is that the Messiah was coming, that the world was in darkness and sin, and that a Messiah was necessary and graciously provided, and that he hung on a cross, and he bore the sins of men, and for the punishment, all of the wrath of God poured out on him that men, by believing, would be saved, redeemed, adopted into the family of Christ to await the utter bliss of seeing him face to face one day. This is what the scriptures tell us. But now apply it. And he testified to them. He makes an application of it. So he expounds, he testifies, and then it says he also tried to convince. And here's where Paul makes the invitation. He says, here's the evidence. There is a warning. And now I am asking you, respond. Respond. As though God through us Reaching out to humanity saying, be ye reconciled unto God. Paul says, I only got you once. And see, if you leave, I can't even follow you out the door. I'm going for it now. Because even if I could leave this house, I'm not sure that you're promised tomorrow. Things change, man. And Paul expounds, testifies, and then he tries to convince not just making a dissertation, but with the stated goal of trying to persuade and convince them. Their very souls hung in the balance. He was not pitting his religion against their religion. It's not my team against your team. That's not my mission. My mission, says Paul, is to save your sorry lost soul as mine was one day saved by the grace of God. And he tells them, it's now in your court. He doesn't hold back. You remember that was always Paul's, one of Paul's concerns. You remember that in, in, in Acts chapter 20 when he's, when he's calling to Miletus all of the elders from the church in Ephesus and he says, I am free of the blood of all men. I did not withhold the whole counsel of God from you. What a way to go, huh? I want to Die speaking those words. If I can rightly and truthfully put those words on my tombstone and your tombstone, what victory that would be. I did not withhold the whole counsel of God. 
Paul gave it to them all. But there was a requirement of a, of a response. And you see the boldness of his message because it says that he was testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus. The kingdom of God and about Jesus, the crux of his message. Now, now this is bold because he's in Rome, chained to a Roman soldier, speaking to Jews who were so often in cahoots with the Roman government. And he starts talking about another kingdom. Man, that gets back to Nero, and it's on. And not only another kingdom, but a greater king. And he told them about Jesus. It all came back to Jesus. That was all his message. He wasn't saying, come join my church, come join my religion, come see our ministries, our programs, come hear our band. Only Jesus saves and satisfies You can imagine what that soldier must have gone through watching all of this. There's stories when you go to Rome. I've, I've been to the place where tradition tells us Paul was held and, and for his last moments before he was beheaded. And there's, there's stories that are told of how since the Romans worked in shift work that they used to bring the, the Roman soldiers there and they were working, and if I'm not mistaken, it was 12-hour shifts initially with Paul. And by the time they would come back to relieve the guy who was watching Paul, they would find that Roman soldier down on his knees weeping in repentance. And they would say, no, we got to change this. And so they changed it to every six hours. And every time they'd come back after six hours, they'd find another converted Roman soldier. And they got down to three hours. What do you do? I mean, you've got to sit there, and there's a window on the cell. I've seen it. It's enough to get the gospel out of. The guy can't go anywhere, and neither could Paul. And so Paul is, is doing what he's always done, but under different circumstances. Christian service is nothing if it's not flexible. That's not how I'm used to doing it. My last church used to do it this way. And it says that he told them about Jesus from the law and Moses and from the prophets. How that in the law and the writings of Moses, and that included as well, in most references, the Psalms as well. Sometimes the Psalms are referred to as part of the prophetic books because they are so prophetic. But even in the law, even in the ceremonial laws, Everything pointed to Jesus. A lamb, that's Jesus. The bread, that's Jesus. The candles, this is Jesus. It's Jesus everywhere. It's all foreshadowed, type and figure of the coming Christ. And it's all about Jesus. And he says, do you see? Did you ever wonder? I know you've wondered, Jews. I know you've wondered. Why do we do this? Why do we do it like this? Why do we have to be so precise? Because everything is pointing to Jesus. And now that Jesus has come, it all makes sense. And he spoke to him also from the prophets. And if you ever read the prophets, it is downright frightening. The detail with which they speak of he who was to come hundreds of years later. Read Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was born. And he tells us with detail about, about how he would be born, how he would live, how he would die. You read about what David wrote in Psalm 22 and other of the Messianic Psalms. It talks exactly about what Jesus would suffer. This was no surprise. Jesus was exactly as foretold. And he lays this out before Jews who were very familiar with these scriptures. And then verse 24 says, Some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And even in this, Paul was like his master, Jesus, because you remember even Jesus would speak to crowds and not all would turn. And here you see Paul, after, after all these years of serving God so faithfully, he doesn't stop and say, man, some of these folks still aren't believing. I'm entitled to at least better percentages than this. I'm entitled to at least see more people be saved than this, but it's never been up to Paul. Paul's only measurement is faithfulness, as is yours. Fruit comes from God. Faithfulness is our offering to God. 
And at the end, that's what you'll be measured by. That's what we'll be measured by. We're sharing with the Connect group the other night. And sometimes we feel like because I can't do something great, I can't do anything. Because I can't do something on a large international stage, then, then what I do doesn't matter. We will all be measured as to how faithful we've been to our particular calling. First and foremost, know what it is. Jesus told the parable of how the sower went forth to sow seed and fell on different grounds. You remember stony thorns. It falls on good soil and it springs forth and it says, and they bore fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Some were made to bear 30. Some were meant to bear 100 fold. And the 30 might look at the 100 and say, well, because I can't bear 100, I won't bear any. Let me tell you something. The 30 is responsible for what he's been called to. For the 30, it is not sin when he does not produce 100. For the 30, it is sin when he produces 29. Because faithfulness is the measure. And Paul was faithful, knowing some will receive, some won't. As a matter of fact, he took his comfort not just in the statistics, not just by tracking numbers and comparing himself to other preachers, but because this was prophesied. It says that some were convinced and others disbelieved. That word disbelieved is not as passive as it sounds. It's not like, you offered, I didn't receive. No, it's more active than that. It is a deliberate choice to go against what is true. Just like some today will leave. Some today will leave. It's not that in your heart you're saying, I don't believe that Jesus is Savior. It's not that you're saying, I don't believe that I'm a sinner. It's not that you're saying, I don't believe he's going to return. But even in face, faced with all of that evidence, I will walk away from this back to the style of life that I'm used to. In the dangerous fallacy that there will be next Sunday. I'm too young to worry about it. I'm 14, man. I got the whole world ahead of me. I'm 20. I'm about to embark on my career. I've got a... Friend, I want to expound. I want to testify. And I want to try to convince you today. As Paul did on that day. We are going for broke with every song we sing, with every prayer we made, and with every word I'm preaching to you today. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus in real ways. Step away from dead, dry religion. Step away from the pride of thinking that you're bulletproof and indestructible and that you have forever ahead of you. Those are the famous last words of a lot of dead citizens of hell. Some were convinced, some weren't. They disbelieved. Verse 25, and disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. Paul says, well, you're going to leave? You're going to leave, huh? Some of you are going to go leave and find the other Christians and be part of the fabric, the whoop and wharf of the, of the Christian life. You're, you're saved now. You're new creatures. But some of you are going to leave out of here because you chose to disbelieve. It's not that the evidence I produced did not meet your high standards for truth. It's that you've chosen this. You've chosen a lesser existence, he says. But as you leave, my parting shot to you is this. Paul had one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their eyes... Excuse me, with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. This is what is called in the Bible a, a judicial hardening. You, you, want, you, want, you want to play? 
You want to play like the gospel doesn't matter? You want to play like God is not a loving Savior? You want to play like this is not urgent? You want to play as though your sin or your philosophy is actually comparable to the gospel that is being offered to you? He says, you want to do this? He says, God says, I'm going to give you that, and I'm going to give it to you in truckloads. He says, I will harden your heart so that when you do want to, you can't receive. God has a line. He says, Israel, your hardening is coming. And now we turn to the Gentiles. Now this is not to say, Isaiah was not saying, nor is Paul saying, nor is Luke saying, nor am I saying. That any of the Jews that believed were cast out? No, there is much brothers and sisters. I can't wait to meet them. And Jews today that are believing, there is still salvation only through Jesus Christ. And Jews are still believing. Nor is it saying that no Jew could ever believe in the future. Nor is it saying that only Gentiles will be saved. But he's saying as a nation, the promises and the privileges of being that commonwealth of Israel, he says, it's not the same anymore. The gospel has come, you have rejected it. He says that a hardening comes. But Paul says, well, I mean, where does Paul get the right to speak such heavy things to them? You heard the gospel now, you have your opportunity. Where, where, where does Paul get off speaking to them so? Strongly. It's because with the proclamation of the gospel comes huge responsibility. To know the truth, to know the way of salvation, and to take it lightly comes with huge repercussions. It was true then. And it's true now. Friend, won't, won't you turn to Jesus? Won't, won't you believe? And, and, and saint, won't you live and labor as though you come to Jesus? Sometimes I'll just crumble under the weight of thinking of how much good teaching I've heard in my life. How much good ministry has come my way. How many blessings God has sent me through people. I should be bigger. I should be more like Jesus. I should be more humble. I should be more bold. I should be more courageous. I should be more tender. There's a huge responsibility with com that comes with sitting under the gospel. And Paul says, with one teaching, Jews, you are now responsible. For those of you who are waiting to come back next week and see if Pastor Eric continues to make his case and see if it meets my standards we're so glad you're here and you are responsible turn to Jesus would you turn to Jesus turn to the one that loves you more than anybody I don't care what he's offered or what she says she'll give you turn to the one that loves you more than you could ever imagine but know that to reject him is not just to reject love but it's to incur wrath it's one or it's the other. It says in verse 30, and we clear, he lived there for two whole years, two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came. He welcomed all. Yeah, more Jews, Gentiles, everyone who would come. Two years, Paul, the mobile Paul, sitting still. Why didn't Paul give up? It was actually from a Roman jail cell 
under Roman custody, I should say, that Paul wrote the following words to a young pastor named Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. He tells Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David. He just, just heaps all of these wonderful and true titles. As preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering. I'm suffering for the gospel. I'm not suffering because the Jews hate me. I'm not suffering because the Romans are mean. I'm suffering for the sake of the gospel. He says, I am bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. I don't care. It's not that I don't care that you're in a situation. I just don't care what your situation is if you think that it will preclude the preaching of the gospel. I remember I went to visit somebody in the hospital one time. We were in the intensive care unit. And there was one guy in the bed there getting nothing but bad news. And the other guy next to him was slipping in and out of consciousness. And the one guy's watching the other, listening to the nurses. And I'm waiting for the third bed because the person I went to visit was there. And I see every time this person would become lucid, become just a little bit conscious, the guy would look over and say, hey, can I pray for you? Jesus. He's the answer, man. Can you hear me? I said, Jesus is the answer. I'm thinking, dude, if anybody ever had the right to take a day off, it's you. I heard what the doctor said. You might be in worse shape than him. As much as this guy probably would have liked to have been on some street corner or behind some pulpit, I never got his whole story. When he realized that he couldn't go, he also realized that he couldn't stop. And if you're waiting for your perfect day and your perfect situation and a change of your personality and all the circumstances to come together, I'm here to tell you what we have been studying for the last 15 months. Today is the day of salvation. All else pales in significance. Every other asp aspiration in your life, every other ambition in your life is to serve that greater cause. And the reason we're reading about Paul is because Paul got it. The word of God cannot be bound. And he knew and he accepted and he rejoiced in this. He didn't complain about the chain because he knew the chain didn't make the difference. Matter of fact, the chain opened up new opportunities. How do you know this, Pastor? I know this because from a Roman cell, Paul wrote the following words as he closes his letter to the Philippian church. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you here in Rome, especially those of Caesar's household. This chain is not the problem. If it wasn't for this chain, there wouldn't be brothers and sisters in Caesar's own house. Circumstances open opportunities. And all the reasons you say you can't are exactly the reasons that you can and must. And verse 31 closes, and I'll let you go with this. Paul was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. All boldness. Not a measured kind of boldness, with all boldness. Preaching it like he's always preached it. Just with a little bit of background music from the clank of his chains. Just, just with somebody standing on his side wearing armor. A little different, but 
but still just as bold. And if Paul moved as much as me when he talked, that poor soldier was probably chasing him around all over the place. But he preached with all boldness, and it says without hindrance. Last words in the book of Acts. He preached with all boldness and without hindrance. And, and I look back and I say, how, Luke, how, Luke, can you say this is without hindrance? I mean, really, cooped up in a house, chained to a Roman soldier. I mean, sitting there, externally, those outside hindrances, those things that keep us from, from being living witnesses. He's under house arrest. He's got chains, a Roman guard. He tells us later he's got physical sickness. He's advanced in years. Any, any one of these things are good enough reason for some of us not to do anything for Jesus. And yet, Luke says he had no hindrance, not from external factors, nor from internal factors. Nothing inside of him hindered his preaching either. No sense of entitlement to take it easy. I was heartbroken as a young, as a deacon, probably 20. And I remember I talked to a, a missionary who had come back from the mission field, and, and I, I, I still do hold him just high regard for people who uproot and go for the sake of the gospel and he came back from a, a tour of several years he was still young still vibrant God had kept him he was healthy he was, and he comes back and I had the opportunity to have coffee with him and I says tell me man what's next what's it look like next what, what is it what is it now he says what is it now I put in for a couple of big churches with nice paycheck and a big staff. I'm done. I said, man, you're in your late 30s. Hey, I did it. You haven't done it. I'm done. And something in my heart broke. And I said, I just don't see that in Scripture. I just don't see us evening up the account with God there. There. I've served now. I've served hard. Yeah, I know the whole cross, Calvary thing. Well, I did my thing too. And, and I pay a tithe here and there. And I did Sunday school for a couple of years. But it's pretty good. hear the old hymns talk about our indebtedness to the saints. Paul had no sense of entitlement that was hindering him on the inside. I've suffered. I've been through more than anybody else. I'm done. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't have fear of man. He doesn't have bitterness toward man or God. And he doesn't have inflexibility toward his new circumstance. He says, let's do this. I can't go, but I can't stop either. And with these words... The first time this letter is delivered with these words, Theophilus puts down the cards. You remember Theophilus? You remember Theophilus, don't you? You remember how this book started? Chapter 1 and verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given command through the Holy Spirit to his apostles. That's how the book of Acts started. This is a letter to Theophilus. I guarantee you, Theoph I guarantee you, Theophilus read this in one sitting. This, this is what it is to serve God. This is how real He is. This is how powerful He is. What, 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 what were you saying, Luke? Luke, I had no idea. And he puts that book down. Never again would He be the same man. And I pray that you would do the same. Now that we're done with the book of Acts, some of you are going to say, oh, I'm not fine. It's never not the same. Because
Jesus, it would be the ultimate, it would be the ultimate audacity to read of the bloodshed, the sacrifices made, the grace and the provision of God, and to go about our lives as though we were unaware. Oh, but the blessing of it all. What is ours? I, I was getting a little nostalgic here. going to kind of miss you guys. And I'm reminded, by the way, what we're still going to have to go through that, but the question came up, but does it have meaning? That's what the gospels were. mind putting my own shoes on and showing up Sunday morning. That's what the gospel does. It doesn't just make us sing a few songs and stop cursing. That's what the gospel deserves. And I don't know about you, but I've not lived up to it. something in my spirit, there's something in his spirit that tells me 